Good morning, Argyle family. Let's try that again. Good morning. Let's all stand together and sing. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. See your praise. Welcome everyone to our service today, and it's good to have all of our SunQuest people back this week. And um, I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. So don't forget, if you're joining us online, to put a comment um, and let us know that you're here and give us a chance to welcome you. So we're going to start with this week's or this month's new memory work. So we have a new verse, and um, Brad is going to be giving out cards after the service today in the foyer, so be sure to get one of those. But our new verse is Matthew 28, 19 through 20. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Also, our new chapter for this week is Acts 13. So if you're following along in your journal, be sure to be reading Acts 13 this week. There are still some of the tools as well for our Go and Love series out in the lobby, so be sure to pick those up if you haven't already. And, I mean, there's one more thing, <laughs> if, you, if you have memorized your, your memory work and would like to share that, Brad would love to have you do that, 
or if you um, have anything from our study of Acts that you'd like to share, he would love to hear that too. So there's a sign up in the lobby for that. We have new classes beginning this week. Brad is going to be in the auditorium for the adults. Kevin is in the upper room with the young adults. And Mary Jane is in the fellowship hall with the women's class. The Christmas boxes, several of you have asked me about the Christmas boxes this morning. I um, emailed with Benny Baker from Mission Par Cristo this week, and he's planning on coming through town on Friday to pick up our boxes. So you still have a few more days. If you haven't um, brought your box up, you can do that. You can also give me or Marion uh, money, and we'll go buy or fill up some boxes for you. So we've got quite a bit of money, so we'll be shopping this week, and we should end up with um, a pretty good donation of boxes this year. So thank you for doing that. And there's also an opportunity to help the Hurricane Ida victims or help with the relief for Hurricane Ida. Um, Levanta and Luella Caldwell are contacts for that, and you can see the church email for more information. And um, that's it for this morning, so let's worship together. Before I spoke the word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took the breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me.
celebration Passover, Passover that um, Jesus did with the, his group, and I was going to speak Matthew's account, but my son Kyle was looking over my notes before I came up here, and he said, I, I, Dad, I want you to read the Corinthians part. He said, more detail. I said, okay, son, I'll do this just for you. So here it goes. All right, so this is Paul speaking. Um, for I have received of the Lord... That which I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. And he would pray with me. Dear God, our eternal Father, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread and this cup to the souls of all who receive them, that we may eat and drink in remembrance of the body and the blood of your Son, and as a witness to you, dear Lord, that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of your Son and always remember him keep his commandments that he gave us, and that we will always have the Spirit right here with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those that are participating in the we worship, the kids' worship program, are dismissed at this time. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where he may
a good morning. I'm so glad to be here. Oh, oh, it's so good to be with family and to worship God. And, you know, I uh, had a great weekend last weekend out at SunQuest and with the youth program and lots of other groups. But it is so good to be back here. And it is such an honor. I want you to know what an honor it is to me to be able to share from God's Word. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. So who wants to hang out with me and some of the elders on October 1st and 2nd? Anybody? Okay, well let me tell you what I'm getting at. I have a flyer um, that we're going to have available for you. It's some information, but I'd love for you to join me. But it's an event that's October 1st and 2nd, and here are the details. It is for parents, leaders, and teachers. What it is, it's a conference-type event centered around God's design for sexuality with the purpose of equipping and encouraging you to have open, honest conversations with your young person on these topics. So this is a Friday and Saturday event. It's in Ocala. It's really close. Um, well, I, I don't know how many the group is that's going, but I know I'm going to be there. And th there's details on how to register for that. It's just a website. The cost for that is a donation. So you can name your price and you can go. They have a recommended price of $40, um, but they don't want that to be a barrier to that. So very relevant, very close. 
and it'd be great if we had some good Argyle representation just to be with one another. So if you're interested in this, make sure you pick up a flyer. And if you do plan on going, uh, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that with the office, just write an email or call us just so we can kind of know who's going to be there. Um, but I'm really looking forward to that. So like I said, God is so good. And so today I want to share with you to start with this little bug that I took a picture of a few weeks ago. So I, I saw this bug and I've seen this bug before. I've seen this bug before in my life and I've been very curious about what exactly am I looking at? And I know it doesn't look like much to you on the screen. So let's show this video. And this is me zoom taking a, a video and then zooming in on that video. And then Craig has zoomed in even more on this video to show you what you're looking at. It just looks like a clump of dirt, right? This is the junk bug. It's called the junk bug for a reason. And um, you would just think that it is just a piece of debris or something that is walking along. And I think when I saw it before in my life, I thought, oh, this is just a confused ant He's taking out the garbage or something, okay? But no, the junk bug, he's actually kind of scary, okay? The junk bug actually has these two hollow fangs. And what he will do is he will come up to other insects and he will stick his fangs in them and he'll suck the body outside of the insect. And then you know what he does? Then he takes the, the leftover of that bug, throws it on his back. So what you're looking at is just a bunch of dead insects and debris and all this, and it makes great camouflage. Uh, other predators just think it's a, you know, a piece of dirt. Uh, but, oh, man, this guy is, he actually, this is only a stage in life. He becomes a, a green-winged uh, insect that's actually pretty cool looking. Um, but anyway, that's the junk bug. Now, you wouldn't know much about the junk bug unless you really look into what's going, what's going on there. You can actually take that apart, and you can find little insect, ugh. But anyways, you wouldn't know unless you really looked into it. Well, the other creature that I want to show you this morning, I'm not even going to give you any details. Really, I'm not going to tell you about its lifestyle. I'm not going to tell you what it does. It is the Eurasian jay. <laughs> no other details needed, right? We're looking at gradients. We're looking at colors. We're looking at patterns. I don't know how you can... Be honest with yourself and feel like that is a product of mindless chance. Do you see the glory of God this morning? Do you see the eternal power and the divine nature of a creator God from the beginning of time through the things that have been made? Just, ah, oh, incredible. I don't even know if I've ever seen a Eurasian J before this past week. And here's the thing. We'll never stop seeing amazing creations that God has made in this world. Amen. Oh, he's so good. He's made it plain. We got to stop ignoring the things that are right in front of us. The glory of God is right in front of us. So today we're actually going to work backwards before we get to Acts chapter 15. But I want to set, this, set up the stage for what's taking place in Acts chapter 15. And Acts chapter 15 is a very, very crucial, important chapter in the book of Acts. And so first I want to just go back and remind you of a work of the Spirit. And don't tell me it's not of the work of the Spirit because in Acts chapter 13 in verse uh, 2 it says, the Holy Spirit said... The Holy Spirit said, and he, and, he, and he selected Paul and Barnabas for a work. If this is bringing back some memories, good. So the Holy Spirit said, take out for me Paul and Barnabas for this work. And so they set sail and they go to Cyprus. And when they're at Cyprus, they, they go from Sabbath to Sabbath and they're teaching the good news. But then the proconsul, the Roman proconsul, and uh, this false prophet, Bar Jesus, is ringing a bell. All right, he wants to hear. So they bring him in, and, and Bar Jesus, this false prophet, says, no, he tries to put a stop of him coming to faith. But well, Paul looks at him and he says, you son of the devil. Oh, calls him out. You son of the devil, you will be blind for a time. <laughs> Needless to say, Sergius Paulus believed. Okay? So they leave Cyprus, and they go to Antioch. Not the Antioch where they started, but a different Antioch. And while they're there, there is two teachings there's two teachings on two different Sabbaths. On the first Sabbath, they say, hey, do you have a word of encouragement? And so, oh, yeah, I got a word of encouragement. And so he starts telling the history of the people of God. And he says, 
This is who we are. And Jesus is actually the fulfillment of the promise to God's people. And people are amazed and they accept this message that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of Scripture and there is a new righteousness that's available that is through faith in what he has done. And they love it. They love it. And they say, be careful, though. Don't be scoffers of a work of God. They say, come back and tell us more. Tell us about this. And so they come back the second Sabbath. And on the second Sabbath, they say, not only is there this new righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus, but it's also available to everyone, to all nations, not just the Jewish, holy, separated nation of God. Do you think they liked it? No. There were some that, that they incited violence among the leading men and women of the town. So here they are on this work of the Spirit as they go from place to place, and they're telling about this new righteousness, this new message, but now there's a message that is going to follow them. This is very important for us to understand and see. So then we get to chapter 14 where they go to Iconium, and it says in verse 2, unbelieving Jews poisoned the minds of the people. They poisoned the minds of the people, and what it did is it created division. In verse 4, it says that the, the, the people of the city were divided. They did not like this message that they were bringing. And in an Iconium, it says that they tried to stone them. They attempted to stone them. That means throwing rocks until the person is dead. So they attempt to stone them, and they hear about this. They get wind, and they leave. I think I would have left too. How about you? Okay, so they leave there, and then they go um, from Iconium, they go to Lystra. And when they're at Lystra, they, they heal a man who's been crippled from birth. Amazing, incredible, undeniable work of God. We've seen this guy our whole life. He's been crippled since birth, and now he's leaped up, and wow, this is incredible. This is amazing. But it says that yet the Jews came. They came from Iconium and Antioch. They're following them. They're following them. And there, in Lystra, they actually did stone Paul. They stoned Paul, drug him out of the city. Think about how bad it has to be to be stoned and be thought of as dead. And they drag Paul out from the city, but the church, they come and they restore him. And so they, they, they leave from Lystra to go back to Antioch. And at the end of chapter 14, we see, for the work that had been fulfilled... So here we see a work that's set apart in, in chapter 3, verse 2. They go around from town to town. They're giving this message, but there's also another message that's following them, one of, divide, of division and of, and of hatred and of, of, of violence. So along the way, this good news is being followed by another message. So what is their message that they're bringing? Their message is the fulfillment of the promise. The fulfillment of the promise that, that Abraham called out from the nations of other gods. You're going to be a new people, a new nation, and your nation's going to be great. And in their minds, they thought this is some kind of, oh, we're in the oppressive government of, of Rome right now. Now the, the Jewish nation is going to be this powerhouse, and we're going to have a new king, and we're going to have a new political figure. But that wasn't the greatness that God promised. The greatness of this, this nation was that Jesus came through this nation, salvation, new righteousness through faith. That was the promise of the fulfillment to a great nation and to all nations. Now, they didn't like this all nations part. And so opposition is following, and that's the backdrop for chapter 15. So here we go in 15. It already, go, it already starts off this way. Men came down. They're following them. But some men came down, they're still at Antioch, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Bartimus had no small dissension and debate, I'm sure it was no small thing, I can only imagine. After having no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and to the elders about this question. So some men came down and they make this claim, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. See, the message that's following them is this, 
Yes, we, we like that new righteousness thing that Jesus was the sacrifice and we like that. But it's not just faith. It's faith plus you need to be circumcised and you need to follow all the law of Moses. You see, they had a faith plus problem. They had a faith plus problem and their solution was to go to the source. Let's go to the, the apostles. Let's go to the elders in Jerusalem. And so that's what they do. In verse three, so being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the, con the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of, the Mo uh, the law of Moses. So here they are, they're on their journey, and it says that as they're on their journey, they're telling people of all the things that God is doing, all the conversions of the Gentiles, and it said it brought great joy to them. When they come to Jerusalem, they're received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they begin telling them the same things, that, the same things that brought joy on the journey. The same things that brought joy on the journey. Now they're sharing, but, but some of the believers stood up and they said, what did they say? It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Here again, this faith plus problem is showing up. So, in verse 6, the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. This is a, this is a very serious matter. So they get together and they, they gathered and considered this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So Peter stands up and he reminds them that God made a choice early on. What, were those, what was that choice that God made in the early days? You remember when Peter was up on the roof and he had that vision of this sheet that came down with all the animals and, and he had heard the voice, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, I, no, I, I can't do that. I, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. This happened three times. And what does God say? Don't call common what I have made clean. And then he goes over to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And in that setting amongst Gentiles, he experiences the same witness of God through the outpouring of the Spirit. And they begin to talk in tongues, just like we saw in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. God has borne witness to this. And then, they say, and then he says... We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Just confirmation of the buy-in to this first promise, that there is new righteousness that is through faith in Jesus. We believe that we'll be saved by grace, just like they are. God made it clear. He says there's no distinction between us and them. And this new righteousness by faith, not adherence to a Jewish religious practice. But for some, they still have a faith plus problem. And please stay with me today. If this seems like just so unrelatable and this is not what we deal with or, you know, please just stay with me, okay? So starting in verse 12, so Peter is giving this speech. He's saying, look at how God witnessed to us about this. So in verse 12, and all the assembly fell silent. I think that's interesting. And all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, which is another uh, a Greek 
the term for Simon, which is Peter, okay, who was just up and he was speaking, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the word and, okay, and with this, the words of the prophets agree. Just as it is written, after I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things. So first off, when Peter's given this speech, he says they fell silent. They fell silent. They put their opinions to the side and they listened to the works of God, the signs and wonders that God was doing. And they listened. And so Peter gives this speech, hey, remember what God did and it was through me and how I witnessed what God, this outpouring on the Gentiles? Do you remember that? And not only that, then James says, well, he's recounting what happened early on, but also it's it's fulfillment of what's been said. It's in agreement with the words of the prophets. And he, and he, and he begins to tell them about how the, the rebuilding of the temple of David, that now God, to this great nation, the temple is not in a centralized location in a physical city or place, but the temple of God is where? A great nation, a temple of God. And not only that, but there is a promise there to the Gentiles. And so he's saying, not only is God witnessed this through the outpouring of the Spirit through our experience, but also the prophets, this lines up with what they told us to be ready for. Incredible. So, the words of the prophets agree. In verse 19, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but... There's a but. But should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. So the judgment is, no, they do not need to be circumcised. They do not need to become Jews. But, there's a but. There's these four things to abstain from. So they write a letter in verses 23 through 29. They, they, you can find, that's where the letter is. They write a letter that says, we don't, we don't want to put this extra burden, this yoke on you, but abstain from these four things. So they, to communicate the judgment and the but, to abstain from these four things. So here are the four things. Things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled, and from blood. Now what is this? Is this faith plus? Is this faith plus uh, just a few uh, things from the religious, uh, from the uh, Jewish religious practices? Is this just faith alongside with just a few of them? Now, some will take the position that what's going on here is this church, there's some that are Gentile and there's some that are Jew, and it's a table fellowship thing. It's a weaker brother type of circumstance where uh, just do these things so you can get together and, and, and have fellowship. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't believe that these are distinguished within the Jewish religion that you need to do these four things. I think these four things are listed to distinguish them outside of the Jewish religion. Okay? We don't want to put the burden of, 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 of becoming a Jew, of being circumcised, all that goes along with that. But don't get mixed up. Don't think that these things are just a part of the Jewish religion that you have to ignore. Distinguishing them out from the Jewish religion. Here, we're going to take this one at a time. So in other words, just because you don't have to follow the Jewish religious practices, don't mistake these as Jewish religious practices. These are universal. So let's look at marriage from sexual immorality. When they came into th this place, there were different customs when it came to marriage. Okay? Um, however, don't mistake your freedom not to become a Jew to have any liberty and freedom when it comes to sexual preferences or, or sexual practices. 
Don't confuse this with just something that's Jewish. This is universal. We see in Genesis, from the beginning of creation, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. God's intent from the beginning. Not a, a rule that he gave to the holy separated nation. No, this is a rule for all mankind. This is the context of a sexual relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. Do you see it? How about this next one? Things polluted by idols. Okay, so things polluted by idols. That's not something that we're really too familiar with, but they served other gods. They were in um, communities where they served other gods, and they sacrificed to other gods. And when they would make a sacrifice to another god, then they would have that meat, and they would eat that meat. And it was sacrificed to another God. But we have some other context that will help us out with this. In 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 25 through 29, it says, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Okay, so you go into the meat market and maybe some of the meat has been sacrificed to idols. Maybe it hasn't. Doesn't matter. Go ahead, get it. It's fine. You know, that idol is no, you know, nothing to you. You know that. You can get that. That's fine. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. Okay, so you're invited by an unbeliever and you go into their home and they serve you food. You don't need to say, hey, is this offered to an idol? No, don't worry about it. It's not a big thing. It's not anything. Okay, but if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. For the sake of the one who, is, who informed you, and for the sake of conscience, I don't mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Don't confuse the fact that we have a God, a single God, just a Jewish tradition. Don't Get mixed up with practices of idolatry of other gods. This is not just a Jewish thing. This is a universal thing. There is one God. There is one God. And so don't, don't let your, don't convince yourself this is freedom outside of the Jewish religion just to be a part and associate with practices of idolatry and other gods. Make sense? I hope so. Okay, what about these other two? To abstain from what has been strangled and from blood. These are basically the same issue. The same issue. Uh, these are two things that, that are being eaten. Okay, from th abstain from things that are strangled instead of um, bleeding out the animal, letting the blood flow out, keeping the blood within and, and cooking it that way and eating that, or just directly drinking and consuming the blood. He said to abstain from these things. This doesn't mean eating a medium rare or rare steak at a restaurant, okay? Because those are delicious. <laughs> but that's not the reason. Those, when you, eat, when you order that, that animal has been bled out, okay? That animal has already been bled out. There's still some residual blood. If you order your steak medium, you like yours medium rare, Wyatt? Okay. If you order it medium rare or if you get it well done, it's the same amount, it's just different color. But anyway, it's just so... To alleviate you steak lovers out there. But anyways, so look at Genesis 9, 1 through 4. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. For the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground. And all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is the blood. Okay, one more for you. Leviticus 17, 10 through 12. If anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who sojourns among them eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it, listen, I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for, uh, that makes atonement by the life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, no person among you shall eat blood. 
neither shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. And so what we need to understand, this is not a separation of clean and unclean foods. This is a separation of food and not food. Don't get mistaken and think that this is just a Jewish practice of not eating blood. No, this is universal. Okay? Don't make um, the mistake to think that it's okay to, to flirt and be involved in other things with other gods and to have a polytheistic mindset. No, that's not a Jewish thing. That's a universal thing. Don't think that it's just a Jewish thing that it's a man and a woman in a marriage. Well, that's not our customs. No, he's saying that's not a Jewish thing. That's a universal thing. Don't think that it's just a Jewish thing just to not eat blood or, or have it, the blood within it. No, that's not a Jewish thing. That's a universal thing by the Creator God, His intention for all time. Make sense? So, this is not faith plus. This is faith with the clarification that these four things are not Jewish religious practices, but universal laws of God. So, here's the rest of the story. In verse 22 through 41, they send Paul and Bartimus back with Judas and Silas, and they read this letter at Antioch. And when they read this letter at Antioch, it says, when they heard it, they rejoiced. You know why? Because this is good news. Wow, this is amazing news. Righteousness through faith alone. Now, why the resistance? And I say that, I use that word very mildly. These, mildly. these people are inciting violence. They're stoning people. In their holy pursuit, they are even ignoring sin completely. And they feel justified in it. Why such the resistance? Well, think about what is going on in their minds before the good news. Before the good news, their security of salvation was in affiliation and by their effort. I want you to hear this. The security of their salvation was being a part of the right group with all the right do's and don'ts and by their effort to live out all the do's and don'ts. I wonder if you're starting to see some application surfacing. I wonder if you're seeing some applications seeping off God's, the pages of God's Word. Let me help put it in a couple different ways. The security of our salvation should not rest on affiliation with or to a congregation because they possess all the correct do's and don'ts. That's not the security of our salvation that we're a part of the right group, that we're part of the right uh, congregation. I hope that's not your security. Our security is also not in our effort to live out all the correct do's and don'ts. But that's what they knew. That's why they were so opposed to this. This was their security. Our, the security of our salvation should not rest on this. The, the, the security of our salvation should rest on faith in the completed work of Jesus on the cross. And our faith to then follow him. If anyone would come after me, he must first deny himself and pick up his cross by faith to die to ourselves, just like Jesus died of his own will, not my will, but your will be done. This is the security of our salvation that we need to stand on. This is such good news. This is incredible news. And I hope that you're seeing this. I hope that the word is convicting because we have to be careful we have to be careful not to turn the New Testament back into an inclusive religion. Let's go ahead and put that next slide on. Not to turn the New Testament back into an inclusive religion with the correct do's and don'ts through which we are saved by our effort to live out. Do you think the church is ever guilty of that? You also notice there's a side fruit up there. And the side fruit of that is division. The same division that those who were following the message were poisoning the minds that was bringing division. We have to be careful not to have a faith plus problem. Now some of you may say, I don't want to, I don't really like where you're going here, Brad. You're making me uncomfortable. Well, I want you to know um, the security of our salvation is not faith plus 
membership at the right denomination. Amen. The security of our faith, our, 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 our faith the, I'm sorry, the security of our salvation is not faith plus taking communion every Sunday. It is not faith plus worshiping in the correct style. It is not faith plus worshiping on a specific day of the week. It is not faith plus a building with or without a kitchen. It is not faith plus the proper sin management. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. And my wife has used that term back on me. Uh, but don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay, don't hear me out. Uh, or, no, hear me out. <laughs> don't walk out on me yet. Okay, don't hear what I'm not saying. <laughs> we have to be careful, though. We have to be careful because... And I'm not trying to take a jab here at you at, at all this morning, but if we, we can kind of, in a very similar way, say, stop. <laughs> you know, those who heard of the signs and the wonders among the Gentiles who said, stop it. They must be circumcised and forced to observe all the religious practices of our people. We don't want to be in their shoes. We don't want to have a faith plus problem. And I think the pushback to what you're hearing me say is the security of our foundation is of our salvation is faith alone I think the pushback and the fear is well Brad you're just saying that you can do anything you want I'm not even gonna take communion anymore I'm not gonna go to church I'm not that's not what I'm saying the pushback is oh well you can just do anything you want not to that I would say absolutely not because by faith also we lay down our lives we lay down our lives this replacement of wills when we can give up in life and say, you know what, I'm done trying. Sin's not working for me. My self-righteousness is not working for me. I'm going to give it all to you. I don't even want my willing. All I want is you. And in exchange for that, God gives us a new heart. A heart for Him, not for self. And He gives what we've been looking for our entire life. And it's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing. Being made right by faith. A heart for his will and his works. Our effort is not to become righteous. Our effort is not to become righteous. Our effort is because we have been made righteous. Don't listen to the accuser. He will tell you right now, don't believe it. He will tell you right now, you are... You are not the child of God that he wants you to see. Don't believe it. It's a lie. You can stand upon the righteousness of God today. You can walk on holy ground with the Holy Spirit within you. Don't listen to the accuser. Don't listen to you being disqualified. Don't listen to your past. Stop it. Stand by faith. Not in who you are, what you did. But in the blood of Jesus, what he did for you. Jesus died on the cross not to show you how bad your sin is, but to remind you to see how valuable you are. <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> it is good news. We work out of righteousness. We do not work to gain righteousness. So it's not a freedom pass to just live in selfishness, is it? Not at all. Because when you stand on the goodness of God and when you've been made right, when you are ready to lay down everything, not my will but yours, and you receive this righteousness, this peace that passes understanding, all you want is him. All you want is what you desire for me, God. Because my road, my will, I know where that goes, and it's nowhere nice. I want your will. What do you want? And we start to hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see, it's not a license to sin. It's not a license because we've, we're not judged by our sins anymore. No. It's, it, transformation is the, the, the goal here. God wants to transform us into love. Oh, it's such good news. Now, some of you may be asking the question, well, what about baptism? Some of you may be saying, well, 
You're saying don't have a faith plus problem, Brad. And, but what about baptism? Well, I think there's an interesting comparison when we look at circumcision and we look at baptism. With circumcision, to the Gentile was a symbol that brought with it the obligation to live out all of the Jewish laws and customs. What is baptism? Baptism is something that is done to you, right? We don't baptize ourselves. Any of you baptize yourself? We don't baptize ourselves. It's an act that's done to us, and it is a witness of what the salvation power is. It is a picture, it is a witness of what Jesus did for us when he died and he was born again. And we're following him when Jesus says, if anyone would follow after me, he must first deny himself. We're doing the same thing. A replacing my will. I die to myself and we're showing what the power is. And we do so in obedience to what has been commanded of us. Ah. So, baptism doesn't make a Gentile a Jew, but it does destroy and abolish the difference between the two. So we are saved by faith alone. Faith in the Savior's sacrifice to you and faith to die to self, to repent, to live for Him. By faith we walk. And when we die to self, self is the problem. Self is the problem. And I believe this with all my heart that, that Jesus came to this earth to save us from ourselves. Because we can live a life where we turn away completely from God and we live our life in just selfish pursuit. Not that we're trying to be like overtly greedy or anything, but what seemeth right in a man's eyes isn't always right, okay? And we can live our life just, I don't wanna please God, I wanna please myself. And so all of these issues, I wanna live my way, I wanna pursue um, uh, relationships in my own way, I'm seeking fulfillment, and you can do that. And you may think, well, what's going to really fulfill me is if I have a lot of money, right? I just need a lot of money, and that's what I'm going to pursue, and you can get a lot of money. Let me ask you something. Do you think a lot of money is going to truly make someone fulfilled? Absolutely not. Or you may think that for you, fulfillment is to be found in fame. Or to be found, uh, for you, that fulfillment is in in. Any, anything. It's just what you desire. And the end result of that road is you will not be fulfilled in the least. You will never be fulfilled in anything other than being reunited with your creator God, abiding with him. And so you can live your life for self and never be fulfilled. The other way about life is you can actually tor t turn towards God but in a way of your self-righteousness that yeah, I'm gonna live my life and I'm gonna become righteous to you I'm gonna and if we have that mindset and I've been there before and I think there's probably people in here today who know and can relate to that but turning to God through your own self-righteousness which is nothing but filth and bribery to God because you've come before the great judge, the, the judge who is just. And I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? Any sin, all sin separates us from a perfect holy God. So if we plan on coming to him with our self-righteousness and say, listen, God, I know I've sinned, but there are a lot of people out there that are really bad. Look at them. Don't look at me. Right? Is God being just in that case? Or we say, you know what, God, I know I've sinned. I know, I know I don't meet your standard, but look at all this other good stuff. Don't look at the sin. Look at all this other good stuff. Judge. Like you're bribing a judge. God doesn't want that. Don't try to come to God in your self-righteousness. The only way that we stand righteous before God is when we die to self and we allow the saving, amazing, powerful blood of Jesus to cover us. He paid and did for us what we can't do for ourselves. Amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is why it's such good news. This is what is so amazing to share with people. It's not in what you do. It's not, that you, it's not a license of sin, but you can have freedom today. You can be set free today. You can stand in the goodness and righteousness of God today when you die to yourself. 
and have faith in him and faith in to surrender to him. It is such good news. So, faith alone in his sacrifice. Faith alone now to live not for self but for God. Living out of the righteousness that we have become. And that's a hard one. (laughs) That's a hard one. Sometimes for us we just don't see ourselves that way. Don't let the devil steal your peace. Don't let the devil tell you you are not a child of God. Don't let your past tell you you're disqualified with abiding with the Lord. Because it is not about what you have done or what you do, but it is about faith in him. It is by your faith that we receive this new righteousness. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Believe what he tells us. Believe in the promise of God. Do you believe in the sacrifice of Jesus that provides righteousness to you by faith or do you not? Stand on the word of God. Know that righteousness. Be able to walk this ground on holy ground because the spirit of God is within me. I can look in the mirror and I don't have to be afraid. I can look in the mirror and I don't have to to be embarrassed. I can look at the mirror and I can say, hello, God. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done for me. And I believe it. (laughs) I believe it. Walk by faith, not by sight. So, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Don't worry, it won't be too too difficult. I need a volunteer who can read. All right, thank you, Michael. Michael, stepping out on faith. I love you, brother. Michael, will you read this prayer for us this morning? You're on the screen. Perfect your love in me to love others. Raise up your church to proclaim your name. I am prepared to share my hope. Continue your amazing acts as I go in love. Thank you, Michael, for stepping out of faith. You can stay up here for now. I'm about to end. I could use some company. <laughs> Who else is ready to step out of faith? Who else is ready to share a message that it is by faith and what he has done for us that allows us to have the righteousness of God? What an amazing message to share, isn't it? Amen. Jimmy, I got another brother coming up here in support. Love it. <laughs> well, with my brothers... And God's word on our hearts, let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for your goodness, for your love. The fact that we do not have to stand before you on our own merit. Oh, thank you for that, God. Lord, we all have a problem. We have a problem with self that leads us away from you and leads us in in an attitude that we can somehow become right for you, God. Lord, help us to see the truth. Help us to see what you have given us. It is not a faith plus anything. It's a faith in you alone. And so we stand on that. And we have faith in your word, God. Help us to see us, see ourselves as you see us, clean, righteous. And Lord, help us to go and love and share this with others. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing. I need you more. More than yesterday, I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Let's sing that again. I need you more. More than yesterday.
more than the next song I more than anything in Lord as I goes by, I will be by your side, cause I never want to go back to my old life. staying with us today and worshiping with us and being here. And uh, I just want to encourage you to stay. Uh, Brad is starting a, a class that will be uh, going on right here in the auditorium. And then I'm starting a much better class. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm starting a new class also uh, in, in the upper room. And uh, we have the women's class. So we have a lot of options for you to, uh, to join us. And we just would love for you to stay and join us for Bible class. We're going to close out tonight, uh, today, uh, with uh, Faith is a Victory, one of those golden oldies that we love, so, or I love so much, so I hope you enjoy this too. Here we go. Encamped along the hills of light, we Christian soldiers ride, and press the battle later tonight, shall be in the glowing sky, against the boat we will below that. for joining us online. I hope that you were encouraged or challenged or whatever God's intention was for you this morning. But Acts, the beginning, the birth of the church and the Holy Spirit empowering witnesses to share this good news of Jesus. You know, it's exciting for me to think and to ponder how God is going to continue to use his church to spread this message to go in love. Well, Go and Love is not just a sermon series, it's also a campaign. It's a work of us asking God to do a great work through us, to use us to bring others to Him. 
Loving others by sharing Jesus is a beautiful thing. And if you this morning are saying, that's not me, well, that's actually a good thing because this is a work of God that is made perfect through our imperfections. So thank you again for joining us. If you are local to the Jacksonville area, then we would love to meet you. Uh, come and join us so we can walk in life together. If you're joining us from afar, what a blessing it is to be joined together through Jesus. And I want to invite any of you who are watching today to consider contributing to the ministry here at Argyle. You can give online or you can send in your contributions directly to us. Remember, love people, follow Jesus, serve community, and praise God. We'll see you soon.